Welcome back, Falcons. Today we begin the second season of our weekly video podcast series, Tune In Tuesday. I'm McKenna and I will continue as your host throughout this semester. Our first episode features a panel of four of our greatest employer partners reflecting on the year 2020. So much happened last year in such a short period of time, and we all had to pivot to be successful because of COVID-19. In this episode, we're going to reflect on the positives, the challenges, and the lessons that we learned. Hey Falcons, here we are for our first episode of Tune In Tuesday this spring semester. And today we have a great panel of employers and we are going to process the year 2020. Some have called it a dumpster fire. Some have said it's the year that we all learned at least one thing new. So the five of us are going to reflect on our time living through 2020 and all the things that were good about it, the bad, and the things we hope we don't have to repeat. Um, so to get started, let's go around and have our panelists introduce themselves. And I'm gonna start with Brody giving an introduction. Hello everyone, my name is Brody Jamison. I'm a recruiter at Thomson Reuters. I've been here for just over two years. And I support our recruiting efforts for both our intern program, um, for the interns across all functions. So anything from tech, finance, marketing to sales, um, and then for full-time hiring, uh, our legal editorial space, as well as, uh, as sales roles too. Katie, go ahead. Hi, I am Katie Kroll. I am the Director of Development and Internships at Northwestern Mutual. We are a comprehensive financial planning firm. Um, I work with our internship team and I also help with our talent acquisition full-time um, recruiting as well, as, as well as help develop and coach all of our incoming interns and newer advisors. So we have a, a big team um, doing a lot of great things, um, but I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Thank you. Danielle, why don't we hit you next? Perfect. Hey, everybody. I am Danielle Savari. I am the Ag Business Recruiter for Lando Lakes. I've been with Lando Lakes for about two years now, but have been in the agribusiness recruiting sector for over eight. And I recruit and work with anything from interns to executive level hiring. So throughout the entire full recruitment process. So really excited to chat with you all today and share some of my experiences as well. And last, but certainly not least, Mel, why don't you go? Hi, my name is Mel. I am the Diversity and Compliance Manager at Fastenal. Uh, for those of you who may not know, Fastenal is an industrial distribution supply company. Basically, we sell nuts and bolts and tools and fasteners and safety supplies, business to business sales. Uh, my team is responsible for that first step of the hiring process. So any application screening and phone interviews starts with my team, which is at our headquarters in Winona, Minnesota, not too far away. Fun fact, our CEO actually graduated from UWRF, so we are a very proud supporter. Um, but Fastenal has 3,000 locations. We are in all 50 states and 25 countries, so wherever you're from, wherever you're at, and wherever you want to go, we probably have a Fastenal nearby. So 2020 is the topic at hand today. And we're going to process all of the learning that came out of it, the things that as companies or organizations may kind of be a new pivot that will stay around, some things that were maybe a one-time, yeah, we tried that, that didn't work so well. <laughs> um, and so the four, the four of you are going to serve as our panel of experts in really looking through the lens of recruitment and interviewing and hiring and onboarding and some of the pivots that have um, come about as a result of the pandemic. So first question, and Melissa, I'm gonna direct this one to you and then the rest of you feel free to jump in, but what is the favorite thing that you learned, whether it was intentionally or unintentionally 
during the year? Definitely unintentionally. I learned that I can be in multiple places at once, virtually. <laughs> That's, that has been so awesome. As I mentioned, Fastenal has 3,000 locations. So I found myself in three different career fairs all in the same day in different parts of the country. And um, it was awesome to be able to represent Fastenal. I've been here for 10 years. So it's awesome to represent Fastenal in those geographic areas where normally I couldn't reach physically. That's great. And we've seen, we pivoted to um, virtual fairs and we have seen that as well where um, employers that previously wouldn't have made the, the trip to our physical location, our, our reach has now expanded. So that's that's fun to see and more opportunities for the students. Anybody else want to weigh in on what the favorite thing they learned, whether intentionally or unintentionally? On the human side, I'll jump in here, McKenna. Um, you know, I think a big thing I've learned is just a lot about my teammates, right? I think that the the face-to-face interaction in an office is great when you can, you know, sit down and have a coffee and, and chat with them in, in the same boardroom uh, or the same coffee shop. But uh, you know, learning about somebody when, you know, their kids might come in or their dog might come into the screen, right? So I think there's been a different lens on on what that is, where that, that approach to meeting your teammates and uh, unintentionally have, have been able to meet uh, and see the human side of a lot of my teammates. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Brody, but that has um, been one of my favorite things of 2020 is just kind of getting an inside look at people's lives um, in a different lens. So that's been um, a huge blessing. I mean, I look, you know, when asked this question, there's a lot personally and professionally I think about, um, and I'm going to go a little bit more personally, I think, uh, because, you know, our professional lives play a big role in our personal lives. And I don't know if it was either intentionally or not, <laughs> but, um, you know, just looking at like the capacity of like a working mom, um, I have four kids and trying to navigate and pivot through, you know, school changes and are they going to go to school and, our daycare, not, you know, we have a nanny that comes in our home and not feeling comfortable. And for at first, for the first couple of months, why we kind of figured out what COVID even was, um, what a pandemic even was, like, we've all heard this taboo word, and all of a sudden, we're living it, like, who would have ever thought that, right? Um, So I think, like, you know, it allowed me to, like, really um, slow down and prioritize, like, my world, like, how was I going to get through um, the foreseen future? And, you know, we're, as humans are um, able to get through trauma um, for short periods of time, but not long periods of time. And so the first like three months, I'm kind of like, all right, this is new, but I kind of like working from home, but not having four kids out here is, I don't know if I like that so much as I'm trying to work um, and teach, you know, algebra and things like that, that I probably didn't pass in high school and college, but um, it allowed me to really prioritize and um, think of my priorities and that being my family. And I, you know, work to provide a a ticket, um, a salary that allows me a ticket to do great things and fun things with my family. And we just learn different ways to build memories and take the time to be present. Um, And I think that's allowed me to be a better leader and be more present um, in how I lead um, today. That's been helpful to the teammates because you're, everyone's going through this, although their experience may be different. Again, it allows us to, to bond and connect and in a different and new way. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of like the one word year. Um, I try to pick a word every year that I like mm. try to live by. And last year, this wasn't my word, but I ended up changing it in March um, to grace and just giving people grace because everybody's going through um, something different. Um, and I think it allowed us to be a little bit more human and not just lead for the business, but also lead on, on a personal level too. Absolutely. Katie, going through 2020, so you said that you changed it to grace. What have you, do you know what it is for 2021 yet? It is, it's presence. I want to be my favorite. Um, I live by this and my team would say I live by this and something I hope I teach other people is be present where your feet are at. And I always say that. And I feel like 2020 have really allowed me to slow down and be more present. And I want to continue that in 2021. Awesome. I like it. What was your word at the start of 2020? Lead. 
was I wanted to lead. And that just meant by lead by example and all that. But during a pandemic, when you have to pivot a hundred times, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be the leader I wanted to be right now, because this is a, a, a new word called pandemic I've never had to live through. So <laughs> Danielle, what about you? Yeah, I think for me, some of the, the biggest things I learned was just resiliency. I know we've kind of heard that in general with the pandemic and outside of the box thinking, just the trainings that we had to adjust, the virtual internships and everything basically within a month and really working with your teammates to be resilient, to get it accomplished. And I think on the personal side, so I live in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and we were hit with a derecho this summer in August. And so I was without power for 12 days, um, no cell service or anything. And it was just like the pandemic plus the derecho and everything. I joked with everybody that I said, if I can live through 2020, I can live through anything basically at this point. Um, so I think just the resiliency through work and the resiliency as a person and driving out to the middle of nowhere to find a signal and like work from my car so I can get some things accomplished. You know, it's just, it's a various different world that you have to work through. And when it is accomplished, you feel great, right? You realize how much you can do and how much potential you have. And I think that's a huge factor of what 2020 has taught us mm -hmm. and the coming together and you know and that sense of community I think is something that at the university we've definitely seen as a result is a stronger sense of community um, because we need to lean on each other in order to get all of our pivots accomplished um, and, and to be successful in retaining and recruiting, recruiting our students and making them um, feel that sense of home and community, even if they aren't living with us um, on campus or even in River Falls. So, yeah. Okay, um, Danielle, this one I'm gonna direct to you to start and then, um, the other three, if you could also weigh in, but Danielle, what is one thing you will continue doing as a result of the pivots and transitions that you've made in the last year? I think one of the main things, there's plenty that we'll probably do, but one of the main things we'll focus on is really offering our interns variety in their summer experience. I think we were so nervous at the beginning of the summer that they're not going to be here. How are we going to connect with them? How, how are we going to be able to make sure their experience is wonderful? And throughout the summer, we realized being able to connect on all these video calls and different, you know, 10 minute coffees with leaders throughout the organization and things outside of just their project or their day-to-day -day work that they're doing every day, how we can connect them with people in the organization and help them with their networking and advancement in their career or something, you know, we'll really add into our internship program as we progress forward because we saw a lot of success and excitement about that throughout the summer as well. Nice. Anybody else? I think that I definitely want to keep the Zoom and Teams video calling. Uh, I much prefer this than picking up the hard phone at my desk and having a conversation. And I think I read a handshake stat actually that said a student's preferred ways of engagement with employers. The first one is email, which makes sense. And the second one is virtual face-to-face, -face, which we're doing. And then the third would be phone. So I think that that's a mutual thing that both us as employers, we've, we've learned and we've been through so many meetings now virtually that in the past we probably would have done in person. So we're learning how to really maximize and use our time uh, for, for the purpose of whatever that meeting is. And maybe that, that will be in person for certain events, but it definitely could be virtual face-to-face -to -face too. So definitely keeping more of this. I got the reputation with um, my work colleagues because when, when we pivoted to at home, um, I was just craving that human interaction so desperately that I started cold calling people on teams. <laughs> and so if a meeting got done early, I would quit cold call one of my colleagues 
to say, hi, how are you? Because the other thing that I noticed is that if you're running back to back in virtual meetings, if you have those extra minutes, you're taking a comfort break and, and you're doing whatever you need to get ready for the next meeting. And some of that casual chit chat that would occur in a face-to-face meeting was maybe smaller or non-existent. And it was just, okay, here we all are, let's get down to business. And so I found myself just craving, what are you doing? What are you eating for lunch? Um, And so I would start cold calling people. And I probably um, will continue to do that. Well, you can cold call me anytime. I love it. Done. (laughs) Yeah, I I love that idea. I might have to steal that. We've we've tried to, just in terms of what we would uh, continue to do at Thompson Orders, we've tried to narrow or shorten meetings by five minutes. So instead of a 30-minute meeting, we've tried to do 25 minutes to try and give a bit of that buffer in between calls, right? Um, but to your point, then I, you know, I think it gives us a couple of minutes to go run and grab water and, and grab a snack or something in between calls and, and get back to your desk. But, um, I, yeah, I think either continuing to have more of that interaction of the first couple of minutes and, and know that, Hey, as people join in, um, you know, having some of that human interaction and conversation, or if you, if you can finish up the call in 25 minutes, you have a five minute buffer, right. Use that to, to reconnect with somebody that was on the call or somebody else that you, that you just haven't talked to that you would normally run into in the halls. Right. Mm-hmm. Because you don't want to come back from this and then feel like all those close relationships that you had now have dissipated. So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, there's so, I mean, just hearing you guys, like, I mean, I'm going to kind of just piggyback off of what you've been saying, but, you know, there's so much, I think, um, that we've learned from 2020 and all the gray areas, and I'm an optimistic almost to a fault. Um, So I... I look at kind of 2020 and I think, you know, I want to continue a lot of the things that we like had to pivot and think quickly on our toes, but I want our team to continue to have to like think quick like that. And like, is, you know, is it high impact and, you know, high cost or is it low cost, high impact? Can we, you know, in the past we might've done a big event. Um, Do we have to do that big event and spend that cost? Or can we, you know, pivot it to a virtual platform, which we never would have thought about prior to 2020, and bring in, you know, a keynote speaker that, you know, would be very motivational and probably cost a lot, but because we aren't having the expense of of a venue or, you know, people's transportation or a meal or something like that, could we shift that cost um, to bring in maybe, you know, one of those bigger facilitators or speakers? So I just want to continue to, you know, challenge myself and our team to think differently, think outside the box. I mean, I want to definitely um, continue to be creative. I would have never in a hundred years said I was a creative person. Um, but I feel like in, I definitely started to put that on my resume, like, Hey, I, I can be creative um, and think last minute. So that's definitely something I want to just continue is thinking outside the box and just challenging our team to do, do that too. And the energy that resulted from that Mm-hmm. Um, was something that was fun where, yeah, it was like, oh, how are we going to do this? <laughs> and so then that, that time and investment in making the pivot, but then when you saw it, like, I not going to lie, I was holding my breath, losing sleep, going into the virtual fair in the fall. I'm like, are you kidding me? How is this going to work? There are going to be thousands of people calling with technical issues. I am not a technical person. We had our division of technology services standing by, which was awesome. And after the first hour, I was like, um, okay, it's happening. <laughs> Canada, that makes but you here I sit. <laughs> right? It makes me think we had a huge, um, we do an intern family night every year where we like um, host um, all of our interns and their parents or their significant others um, to a big event. And it was a very, um, one of our favorite times of year. And we had to pivot in April. It's always in April to a virtual platform. And I'd already planned a huge venue, all these things. But now I had to unplan that and plan this virtual one. I too was like so nervous. I remember sitting with our team and I said, have you guys ever watched Apollo 13? And some of them said yes. And some said no. And I'm like, there was a point in the movie where they had to get him back down to earth. And they like, 
basically took a square something and a circle and they were like, we need to make this square fit inside this circle um, engine park or whatever. And I was like, that's what we have to do right now. Like we just, there's no way, but we have to find a way. <laughs> so I totally feel you. And now I feel like we're experts at it. Right. And to be like, and it worked yeah. and it was great mm-hmm. and connections were made. So mm-hmm. yeah. Anybody else want to weigh in on one of the pivots that they want to keep? Okay. Brody, I'm going, I'm coming for you with this next one. Um, What is one thing you will gladly eliminate from your routine after the pandemic? Yeah, this is, I, I like this question. You know, this, this is kind of a, a unique question in terms of what's the world going to look like after, right? And I think we're still, as we're going through this, we're still figuring it out, right? But I, I don't know that I would necessarily say I would eliminate anything, but just try to blend the two worlds together. Um, so I think about, you know, what have I learned about um, structuring my, my day better so that I can have a good work-life balance and I'm not just walking over to the laptop and I'm, you know, still getting workouts in or, you know, doing sporting activities before or after work. Um, but still finding that balance once we do go back in the office. So I don't necessarily know that I would eliminate anything, but more so just take the lessons learned from going through it and then going into what I'm expecting for, for us at, at Thompson Reuters to likely be a bit of a hybrid world of working in the office some days and working at home is to really be more efficient with my day, uh, you know, once we do move through and, and pass the, 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 uh, the pandemic here. Mm-hmm. I agree with you, Brody, on the, the hybrid approach with some of the items. You know, one thing I think about of not eliminating, but meshing together is those internship trainings. We had to do everything virtual. And yes, I want to have it in person. I want to be able to have, you know, social distancing and, you know, the students at least be able to be around each other safely. But the capacity of having the virtual training really opened it up to maybe some students or individuals that wouldn't have been able to travel or a location that's too far away, you know, and things like that as well. So really just bringing those together to have a good balance throughout it all, I I think is really good for the future. I'm eliminating um, teaching, Um, teaching my children. (laughs) I do not want to do it anymore. Um, I'm over it. I I have my associates in early childhood. I thought I was going to be a teacher. Um, And then I found out that I really don't have that much patience. Um, So I had to switch my degree to business. Um, But so that's one thing for sure that I'm very much looking forward to is having all my kids in school 100% of the time um, with the experts because I'm not one. Um, Thank God for YouTube and Google. Um, It's probably going to help my kids pass their grades. Um, But in a professional world, I definitely would say, you know, I want to eliminate um, all the virtual things. Like I want to have more of a hybrid. Like I too miss interaction. I miss people. Um, I'm a people person. Um, so I need the interaction. I want, you know, to shake somebody's hand again. I want to, I'm a hugger. I want to give them a hug. I want to um, have them in my office. And we are like, I have a pretty spacious office. So like we can sit in here, social distance with mask on and things like that. So it's very safe, but I want to have the hybrid option. Like I want to eliminate just having, you know, pretty much all virtual platform. Um, us as humans, we're made to have human contact and interaction. And I definitely am missing that. And I can't stand it much longer. <laughs> so well said. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Like this, this is really hard to actually think of something I would totally eliminate. Um, I think that means we all really kind of enjoyed learning about how we can mm-hmm. succeed and do well virtually. Uh, the first thing that came to my mind was more of a funny, uh, I would eliminate traveling and driving during a snowstorm because that always happened during the fair. <laughs> always. So, uh, so, you know, the, having that option, the hybrid option, I completely agree. Really uh, figuring out what that event or networking engagement is and deciding what's the best use of everyone's time and what's the most impactful, if that should be something that's in person physically or virtual. So I completely agree with you guys. Mm-hmm. I'm currently doing this podcast in a blizzard. So we're, ha- we have about 10 inches and it's still coming down. So I agree, Mel, you know, I didn't have to travel anywhere today. I'm just sitting in my home office and I'm getting to chat with you all. So it's great. Yeah, right. that's awesome. <laughs> and easier on you, McKenna. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, not having, okay. Not having to staff a parking lot <laughs> during a career fair. Can we talk about this? Because <laughs> 
a couple springs ago, it was a snow NAMI where literally it was a foot of snow and we had staff physically out in a parking lot. It's that stuff where it's like, okay, happy to eliminate that from the equation. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I, I remember it probably was the same year where I drove the company van and stayed at a hotel the night before because I knew the snowstorm was already started or coming. And the van would not drive out of the underground parking up that hill. It couldn't get out. Oh. And our, our general manager in the area actually like put his arm in, in the window and helped pull the van up, up the hill. Like it sounds crazy. And he sounds, he sounds super strong. I mean, he must be, but that was... It was a crazy experience and that's not the only one. <laughs> yes. Yes. We, we don't need to be doing that to execute an event. Um, okay. Katie, in your role, what is one thing you struggled with the most as a result of the pandemic? With the most. Um, Gosh, if you would have asked me this question like April or May of last year, I probably would have had a list of things to tell you. Um, but I feel like I'm so far removed from the struggle um, because it's becoming the new norm. But um, I mean, definitely it was like, um, you know, I don't always like the word word work-life balance because um, I feel like you have to give something away to make it balanced. And so I try to live by this like work-life harmony. Um, and that was definitely a struggle. Um, and still kind of is, it was just a struggle of like how to still be a great leader, how to still lead a team, how to still be there and support, um, you know, my, my team members, um, uh, be a good team player, but still be like an, a present mom and wife, um, community member. So that was definitely, um, a struggle I faced. And I think just in being in a, a leadership position, you know, everybody looked to you to kind of figure it out and we didn't always have the answers. So that was a struggle. It was like, you know, we hope we're making the right decisions. You have to make a decision. Um, you don't always know if it's the right one, but you just have to stand by it and stick to it. Um, thankfully, I, you know, I think we made the best decisions that we were able to with the resources and information that was given to us. Um, could we have changed some things and done things better? Absolutely. Um, but they didn't give us any manual when they said, you know, we're going to have a pandemic. And then they're like, this is how you lead through a pandemic. Like nobody, I don't know about you guys, but I don't, my company didn't provide that to us. Um, but one thing I'm very blessed is, is that, you know, um, you know, on different levels of leadership, I mean, our company had our back and they were coming to the field and asking us like, and the leadership teams, like, you know, what can we do better? Where can we support you? Where can we add resources? And they added resources, so many different areas um, that just made me very proud to stand with Northwestern Mutual and stand with our firm um, because they knew that people were struggling. And so, you know, if it was enhancements in pay or if it was, you know, paying people's rents because they're business owners or if it was um, giving it, you know, a early paycheck until, you know, they could kind of like pay it forward a little bit or if it was, um, you know, motivational speakers coming in and just talking to us, TED Talks, like we had some great speakers come talk to us over the past nine months. So they were just really um, investing back in us, um, which allowed us to continue to impact the community and lead and um, be good advisors and good leaders. So the struggle was real, um, but it's not as um, real as it was, you know, six months ago, even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with Katie. Just to, to piggyback on that there, you know, it was difficult to go into, you know, last summer's internship. And, and fortunately, we were able to keep the majority of our interns on and, and still have a summer internship program. But, you know, that was difficult to think about, you know, how are we going to you know, do these executive speaker series events and these town hall events? Um, and how are we still going to have a, a, a social impact and be able to network with other interns, right? Um, and so it was a lot of learning last year and I, I think it went really well and then was successful, but we had a lot of, you know, we stopped and reflected and then even, you know, discussed it with our, our interns, um, ended up rolling out a, an intern advisory group that was kind of like a, a little intern student council to say, hey, what can we do differently here? You know, what, you know, which, what type of events would you like and, and what would help you with that? So um, like typically we would go to a, a Minnesota Twins game. Um, you know, or we would meet down at the, at the caribou coffee shop. Right. So instead we just did 15 minute um, coffee teams meetings, basically, um, and then downloaded Kahoot and everybody played Kahoot games. Right. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of learning. And, and I, you know, I think the, the nice thing is that we learned along with interns last summer. 
Um, and hopefully that'll help it uh, not be as stressful going in, in, into this summer and, and just be an even better experience for everybody, uh, everyone involved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned Kahoot. That was something that came to my mind too, that a challenge was being more engaging and interactive when we're uh, networking with clubs or organizations or in the classroom. Uh, it's really hard to do. It's easier to do that in person. It's harder to do that virtually. So Kahoot and the polls and the emojis and finding ways to engage with your viewers or audience and and uh, do that was a little bit of a challenge at first. Um, and so we're we're still learning how we can do that and and really come across in a in a great way and make sure that we get our message across uh, because it's really important to us to when we are recruiting to not only just talk about jobs, jobs, jobs at Fastenal because we have plenty of them, um, but we want to talk about something that brings a lot of value to either the classroom, a particular topic, what what someone's learning or a club, a particular area of business that they can learn about and and take with them wherever they decide to go. Mm -hmm. I, I echo all of that, honestly, McKenna, because it's so true. You want, like for me, I know this sounds very casual term, but like I want all of our employees and interns and entry level hires to know how cool they are, right? Like you are cool. We're so excited to have you here at Lando Lakes. And how do I let you know that? And it was great because Lando Lakes did a a good job of just mailing out some goodies to all employees. You guys, we, some of our products go to Cheetos. I love Cheetos. I can't even tell you how many, like, you know, the Cheeto fingers that I had while I was typing (laughs) on my keyboard while I'm eating all the snacks, but just some of those things to let you know, like, you're awesome. We're so glad you're here. And it's hard to really emphasize that when it's a virtual setting. So what are some other small things that we can do to let you know how cool you are? I just had a student appointment yesterday where um, the student was sharing good news about the acceptances that they have received. And uh, um, she pivoted her screen so that she could show me the goodie bag that had arrived. Um, and this, per- this particular student is on their way to grad school, but um, that grad program that was number one going into the application process had sent her a goodie bag and the peer enthusiasm was, was fun to see. So swag, it's an answer to everything. (laughs) I will add one more thing. I think some, I know I still struggle with this is, um, you know, we can have virtual interviews and connect with people. Um, but there's a lot that I'm missing when people aren't coming into our office and the recruiting process. Like I, there's a lot, you know, that was said when an, an intern or a full-time um, candidate would come in and sit in our lobby. And part of our interview process was to have our um, office manager. They didn't know she was our office manager. She thought she was a receptionist. Um, and sometimes people might think because they that's the perception that their title isn't what it is, might treat them differently. And so that was part of like our recruiting process is like leaving them out in the waiting room to engage with other people and um, other team members walking by them and talking with them and just seeing if they were stuck in their phone or were they coming in looking professional from, you know, getting out of their car, coming into our lobby um, engagement, right? And then coming back and shaking their hand. Like I miss shaking people's hand because that tells a lot about somebody, right? Their confidence, um, how they present themselves and hold themselves. I don't know about you guys, but doing this virtually, like I'm missing that, like, um, you know, kind of like your gut instinct when you like first meet somebody, that first impression of like, you know, you kind of go with your gut a little bit. You're not really getting that because you're not feeling the vibe of the room. You're not feeling the vibe of the other person. It's hard to read their body language when you only see maybe, you know, this much of their body, right? So you're not seeing their hands as much. So I really tried to work with my team and like talking with their hands and um, how to kind of read their body and um, maybe ask more um, different questions and maybe that we've asked before and we've kind of changed that format because that struggle was there that um, just natural first five minute impression of somebody um, we're not getting that as much so that's definitely still a struggle especially for our talent acquisition team well and those authentic uh, always in interviews whether it was a student employment position or a permanent staff member it's that informal conversation or dialogue that becomes part of the process. And those informal moments where you have that opportunity to develop that rapport, um, 
how do you maintain that in a virtual space? And so that's definitely been a conversation for us and making them feel welcome and at ease and not like this process is just so robotic and and now okay we're gonna move from one Microsoft Teams room to the next and pivot the audience a little how do you have that fun and and cash at time for casual conversation and rapport as well yeah absolutely Okay, so Mel, I'm going to come back to you for this one. And then I do want everybody to weigh in um, on this one because I think it's an important question or something I will at least deem insightful. Um, what do you think was the biggest lesson that your company learned in 2020? I think just being adaptable. Uh, I mentioned before, we have 3,000 locations. We are in all 50 states. And there's a lot of different rules and, and guidelines and policies that we need to follow, not only statewide, uh, locality, uh, but company and business-wide. Uh, Fastenal is an essential company. We sell and provide PPE and the safety supplies that all of everyone needed, especially over the last year. Um, so we needed to get that product to our customer physically. We had to, uh, but we had to adapt and find the right way to do it. So we have, uh, Fastenal is known for innovation and we ask our 20,000 employees to be innovative all the, all the time. And so uh, we have these industrial vending machines where we can, they look kind of like lockers. And we used a lot of those in certain markets where we had a locker outside of our, our branch and uh, our customer had a code and they were able to go pick up their customer without any personnel interaction if that's what they chose to do. Um, so we had to really adapt to find the best way to interact with our customers because our company mission is growth through customer service. And it's so important to us to be able to do that successfully and keep that relationship and partnership growing and allow them to, to trust us. And that goes in internally within the company too. We had to adapt and and make sure that people had all the technology that they needed to work virtually if they were working from home um, because some people could and some couldn't due to the nature of their work and us being essential. Mm -hmm. I would piggyback off that Mel with the essential business. I think that's something Lando Lakes really highlighted this year and understanding, you know, we're we're feeding people, we're keeping people alive and nourished during this time when the shelves are bare, there's nothing there. We didn't have to dump any milk. You heard about other organizations that had to, we didn't have to because of our employees, right? And how serious they took their job, understanding we are essential for America at this time. How do we get our work accomplished? And it, like, honestly, I have like goosebumps when I think about it sometimes. I'm sitting here at home, I'm trying to find the best people for our organization. And to see these individuals do that for people they will never meet in their life is just amazing in that aspect. And I, our CEO, Beth Ford, I have big props to her. I think she's amazing. And uh, I know we talked about this earlier, but one of her biggest things throughout the year was just give yourself grace, right? Understand you're going to need to take a breath. We're all going to need to step away. We're going to have to refocus. Our supply chain team is working 24 seven, trying to figure out how everything's going to get everywhere. And, you know, there's teams that aren't as busy. So they're learning supply chain so they can help out and just everybody's putting their hands in to get work accomplished. So I think that was one of the biggest items we learned as an organization is just the importance of our business and how happy we are that we've been around a hundred years and that we still are this important in 2020, 2021. Danielle, that's awesome. Um, it gave me the chills. I'm a huge dairy farm supporter. I grew up in a small town with a lot of dairy farmers. And so um, that's awesome. So thank you guys. That's very impactful. Um, you know, just going off of just the discussion of where we are right now and like evolving. Um, I think, you know, our company really has evolved and every company had to, like you had to change and um, how you were doing things. If you didn't, you probably are no longer in business, right? Um, we had to change with the times and you know, we were talking a little bit earlier um, offline just about how, what is the future going to look like? And none of us can really tell, obviously nobody's given a gift or gift of a crystal ball, but we can kind of make some projections and predict predictions, but um, we don't know what's going to hold. So we just got to continue to evolve and be better. 
you know, us being a financial firm, um, during crazy times, people are very emotionally tied to their dollars. And so us too being an essential business, um, people were, our phones were ringing off the hook and they wanted the, not the robot. They don't want like the robo investor online. They want a human telling them, Hey, am I going to be okay? Especially, you know, even my parents, like I look at my parents and it, it could almost bring me to tears sometimes, but it's like, you know, they were about to retire and it's like, do we retire? Like, can we even retire financially? Like, are we going to be okay? And, um, they chose to work for another year, um, just because it was a scary time. And so you look at all these, you know, baby boomers and people who are nearing retirement, it'd be a pretty scary time to, you know, go to retirement during a pandemic. But then there's a lot of people that were forced into retirement, um, because the companies couldn't pay to pay them anymore. Um, so, you know, we dealt with so many different emotions and um, we deal with people's lives. And so when you talk about impact and like your, you know, um, Danielle, your company feeds us, um, you know, it's, in my opinion, it's wealth, um, health um, and happiness um, makes us kind of go around. And we really were a key essential um, component to people's, you know, uh, mental a bill or men mental health um because mm -hmm. financial struggles definitely play a role in that and i couldn't be more proud of our advisors and how they helped people pivot in their own personal and financial lives um but our company backing us during all that and like how they gave us the resources and like help those advisors um give back to their clients without that we would not have evolved the way we did so um i agree it definitely was about impact and just i'm very proud of the company and how they pivoted with us yeah, I, I'm with Katie there too. Just that, you know, taking care of the employee's wellness is is so, so important during these times, right? Knowing that, hey, even though this has been going on for, for close to a year now, right, we're still, you know, this is the first time we faced it, right? So we're still learning from it. But uh, I've been incredibly proud of here at Thompson Reuters just to feel like the, the benefits that our company's added. Um, in terms of making sure that we have technology. So a, a technology stipend, if, if you don't have a desk set up at home um, or benefits around uh, gym reimbursement and, and what that um, will cover instead of just being a, an in-person gym membership because people might not feel comfortable with that, right? And I think that goes back to people's physical and, and mental um, and just their health and, and, and their well-being, right? So I think the companies that, that are going to succeed and that are going to attract um, interns and, and full-time hires in the future are going to be companies that show that they're able to change and, and pivot and add different benefits um, and be flexible to, to the, uh, the current environment that we're in. Brody, I think that's such a good point that um, I want to jump ahead because while we're on the topic of well-being, let's jump ahead to that question. Um, so Katie, how do you show employees you prioritize their well-being and safety during these unprecedented times? And then if the others can weigh in after. You know, since some of my comments earlier, you know, as a leader, it's been hard because everybody has different situations. So we could never have like a blanket, like um, this is what we're doing for engagement because it was so different for each person, or this is what we're doing to help sponsor somebody or help them because I have some people on our team that have children, some don't. So the single, you know, um, advisor might need something different than somebody who's, you know, um, a mom with two kids, right? Their needs are very different. So I think for us, what I think we did a really good job is of is not like trying to put a square peg in a round hole. Um, it was all about individually, like sitting down, almost fact finding our teams and our advisors. Like, what do you need? What do you need more of? Um, and giving them grace. I think that's a word that we're all using a lot. And that really was it. Like, okay, that mom, you know what, you might just need to take the afternoon off and you don't have to use PTO, but take the day off. Um, you know, or that single, you know, advisor who's, you know, maybe only 24 coming right out of college and working, um, you know, he's running at it because he's back to back virtual meetings. And it's like, all right, you need to maybe take Friday off or, hey, we'll send you a gift card for lunch just to go out and take, you know, not have to cook or worry about cooking or what, what might have you. But um, I think our biggest thing was just not making sure it was a blanket statement and um, plan for everybody because everybody is so different, um, but still having the engagements of fun things and just doing extra special things like our team, our leadership team took a drive when we split up our whole office, um, we delivered cookies. Um, and just warm cookies and milk. Um, we dropped them off at the door and we would knock and step back and then we would sit and talk with them for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, and we just to have that engagement, right? Because one thing that our, our company learned is that everybody still wants engagement. They still want people interaction. So how do we still build that culture 
in this virtual world in this pandemic. And so it could be things like that, or it could be, you know, virtual happy hours, or it could be a virtual game night. Um, we did so many fun things that, you know, was uh, open to everybody. But in addition, we slowed down enough to really fact find people and see what their needs were too. Anybody else on the well-being? I think for Lando Lakes, they did a great job right away of making sure we had a COVID helpline. Basically, if you had questions, you had people who, again, would answer your call, right? We don't want to talk to the robot. We talked about that. You want to talk to the person and having some COVID specific benefits and items that individuals could really look at. And our executive team, when the pandemic first hit, had a, had a, company-wide call every week to inform us what the updates were, what they were doing, what we were seeing, um, just to really inform everybody. And then I think as an organization, you know, we did a good job of the other factors to keep people close. I personally was in a book club that one of our employee resource groups did, which is awesome because I love to read, right? So they did different things that people enjoy. And then over lunch hour, we got to have a conversation about the book that we're reading and connect on some of those items and just disconnect from work for a second and get to know people outside of your direct group. So I was talking to people who did work in supply chain or production or at one of our mm. plants. It wasn't my specific talent acquisition team. It was people throughout the entire organization, which was really fun because then you got different perspectives and things as well. So I think it's just keeping that connection and obviously mental health was on top priority, making sure people had the flexibility to get everything accomplished that they need to understand Life is absolutely nuts right now. So talk with your manager about what works best for you and we'll facilitate that. And having virtual you know, counselors available to anybody that may need them um, is really important, especially this past year. So I was happy with everything that we did and happy to see organizations really take that transition this year too. I love that you bring up the ERGs. So a big, big thing for us is that, yes. so typically it's been tied to our your US hub sites. So we've had an ERG that's based in, and for us it's BRGs, but essentially the same idea, right? And so we've had our, our Minnesota BRG and then we had our Dallas BRG or Ann Arbor, but they would be accomplishing the same thing, right? So woman at TR um, and, and there's three different groups. And now coming out of this, it's really been a silver lining of let's bring everybody together and just do events together and, and be one big BRG that works together. and. And I relate that back to our intern program because really that's the same thing is instead of being um, an MSP or a Minneapolis St. Paul intern based out of our Egan office where, where I'm working um, or being a Dallas intern, really it, you're a U.S. intern and, and you might be a sales intern and now you can collaborate and network and you're working closer with people at different sites, whether it's the real work from that interns are doing um, or just different networking events, um, things like that, that, that are just bringing us all together in, in, in the remote environment. And Brody, for our listeners that may not know, can you state what a BRG is? Yeah, so a, a business resource group or employer, employee resource group. So a lot of times you'll hear those terms in, in the professional world, right? But really, it's essentially a student organization um, just for professionals. And I, I think they serve a lot of the same purposes where, um, you know, if you're involved in those student organizations and you're passionate about them, when you join your company and, and you're talking to the recruiter or the hiring manager, ask about those different things. Can you get involved with them as an intern or once you become a full-time employee? Um, Cause there might be some different restrictions there, but they're a great chance to just like when you're a student to, to network, to grow professionally, to take leadership opportunities, things like that. So um, it, almost all companies have them and they just have different variances of, of the, uh, the different groups that you'll have and whatnot, but definitely encourage you to get involved with that as, as you go into your professional career too. Yes, join them. Join the ERGs, BRGs, do it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, okay, let's circle back to just another round robin. Brody, I'm going to start with you. Are you planning for employees to return to in-person work, either fully or with a hybrid schedule? Yeah, so the, it's still being assessed for us um, in, in terms of what we're going to do at Thomson Reuters. We do have a small segment of our, our business um, that is uh, essential employees within our manufacturing center in Minnesota here. But other than that, we are, um, all of our employees are fully remote right now until July. So it's something that's being continually assessed and, and we're trying to figure out, um, and we haven't made a final determination for the summer yet, but what does that look like if we come back in the office in, in July for our interns? Um, you know, typically they start on June 1st, 
for sure they'll be remote for for the beginning of the summer but then what do we do after are we able to have some um some socially distanced events or some events on campus if people are able to make it so um something that we're still looking at the nice thing that i i've really enjoyed from our leadership is i would say about two to three months before um that new return to, to work date since that's been pushed back maybe two or three times at this point um is that they've let us know a couple months ahead of time hey this is the plan we're going to push it back further or we've been told if we're going to go back you know we'll let you know and that'll be the date because everybody has a different scenario whether it's um child care or relocating for their job um there's lots of different scenarios out there so uh, something that we're still looking at uh for thompson reuters but um, at, at least uh, a little bit hybrid right now in terms of the, the essential employees and then the office employees being at home. Thanks. Katie, why don't you jump in next? Oh, Mel, go ahead. Sure, no, our hope is that everyone can return back to the office. We, we really pride ourselves on that type of engagement. So we hope that that'll be the case, but who knows how and when that will happen. So those are continuous conversations that, that our leadership team is having. And our leadership and Dan, the CEO and, and alumni from UWRF has been so supportive and transparent about um, everything that's been going on in all of the locations that we've had. So he's sent out the communications and videos really explaining everything that's been going on to our, our company, our business. And we're very decentralized. So we like to provide the tools and guidance and help to our leadership to be successful, but to also run their business as they see fit when, and be flexible as, as they can there locally while follow, following all the right guidelines that they need to. I've been back in the office since June 8th. Um, and I kept my background like this, not the fun ones that everybody else has, because I wanted everybody to see that I'm in my in office. Um, it's getting remodeled in the next week, so it won't look like this anymore. But um, we've been back since June 8th. Now, not everybody in our office is back. They can be. Um, people are choosing not to be. Um, and again, that's the beauty of our company and our leadership is that we are okay with that. We're allowing people to kind of make that decision on their own terms. I have never felt safer um, in any place. Um, I love to go to Target. Don't feel as safe going to Target as I do coming into our office. Um, we have so many um, rules and regulations in place for the safety of our employees. Um, if I leave my office, I have to have a mask on. If somebody comes in my office, we put a mask on. I have tape on the floor and if my chairs are pushed back, it's set just seven to eight feet away from me and people can still come in and sit in here, but have their mask on. Um, we have sanitizer everywhere. Um, so there's sign in if there's, you know, people, a clients coming in, we can allow clients to come in now. That just started um, back in September. Um, they have to sign in so for tracing. So it's very safe. Um, I don't foresee everybody being back. Um, being on the leadership team, that's been difficult because we really want people to be back in the office um, because you can tell that a lot of people are starting to need that engagement and the environment um, to succeed in because um, they're maybe not being as successful at home as maybe they think that they are. Um, so I do foresee you know, more and more people coming back um, mid, late spring, early summer, um, but I would hope to be back at like 75% capacity this fall. Really, the only thing I have to add is, you know, we're taking it step by step, just like everybody else. And obviously, multiple locations, multiple states, you have to go with state regulations and what they are providing for individuals as well. And um, Lando Lakes, the corporate office is in Arden Hills, Minnesota. So we do have our essential workers in the office and the capacity at the minimum at this point that we can have, but they've done a really good job of the hallways have arrows on what direction you're supposed to walk. You're not crossing anybody. Mm -hmm. There's only certain restrooms available throughout the uh, building. They are cleaned multiple times during the day. All those like safety precautions that are are happening are in our corporate office, but then also our plant locations. You know, there's temperature checks before you can even walk in the building and things like yeah. that as well. So just like everybody else, it's a step-by-step -step process. We're hoping that we can get everybody back in the office, but we'll take it one day at a time. Sure. And I will say, even like we <laughs> talked about a little bit earlier, like I think the future is gonna look different than it did, you know, pre-COVID. Um, there is going to be a world called pre-COVID, during COVID, during COVID and future COVID. So um, 
you know, I do think that everybody's going to kind of work from home and they're going to kind of build that into their calendars. Now that we know we can do that in a, in some type of capacity, like I am for sure enjoying my lake home every Friday up at the cabin, sitting on my deck working. Like I am not giving that up. So unless they want to fire me, it ain't going to happen. Like I'm not giving that up. Um, because now that I've had a taste of it, I am not letting that go. So, um, I do think people are still going to at some, even though we might have, you know, everybody back in the office, they're not going to be in the office on the same day. Cause I guarantee people are still going to select days that they're going to be home working. Um, I guarantee Fridays are going to be a ghost town. It's, you know, the Midwest, we only have so many nice days. So um, I guarantee Fridays will be ghost towns, but it's always going to be safe just based on all the regulations that we do have in, in, um, in force. Okay. You send me that address. I'll meet you at your lake home. <laughs> you <All right>. got <laughs> it. <laughs> and then we'll have an in-person happy hour. <laughs> okay, I love it. <laughs> Um, okay, let's maybe pivot to the questioning around some recruitment practices. So how has the pandemic affected your recruiting and interviewing practices and schedules? Katie, why don't you start? I mean, I think I talked about it a little bit earlier, like it definitely has been different of how to, um, you know, our recruiting process from the time that somebody walks in our door um, to now how they come up in a virtual meeting. So we've had to change some of our questions. Um, we actually had sent people on homework now um, before we didn't do some of those things. So we've actually implemented like a different process and steps um, in our um, selection process. We've added more people into our selection process just so that there's more eyes and ears on a candidate um, that maybe they pick up on something that um, maybe we weren't able to because they aren't in the office when we, knew, when we normally had those walk-bys and um, different like um, engagements when we had a candidate in the office. Um, we do have them come in though. However, at the if we're very serious about a candidate, we do have them come into the office um, on the last interview that we are about to extend an offer um, because we want them to see the office. We want them to see our culture. They, we want to give them a tour. Um, we think that's still very important. So we have um, implemented that. Um, back in September when we were able to start bringing people back into the office. Um, and it's been received very well. Like, I think people are missing that prior to. Um, and then as far as, you know, as far as schedules and things like that, like it has allowed us to bring in some great leaders into career fairs, into class talks, because they don't have to commute. They don't have to drive. Um, we think outside the box, we've grabbed, you know, people from outside of even the Midwest to come in and talk and be part of, you know, recruiting or development of our talent acquisition team um, to help them because maybe they're succeeding in Dallas or in, you know, mm -hmm. California. They're one of the rock star Northwest Mutual talent acquisition directors. So we want to bring them in to teach our recruiters. So we're utilizing that because the schedules are allowing it because we don't have the commute time in there. Um, and I also think that our our hours of recruiting, we used to have like an hour. Now it can be 45 minutes um, because our process is a little bit different. So I think we've changed some things maybe we'll change it back. Um, it hasn't been talked about. We're just going to keep on this um, train right now, um, but it's definitely working. Um, we've implemented some things along the way and we've changed it too, just off of feedback that we've received from candidates. Um, and I feel like we've got a good process down now. Thanks. Our hiring process has slightly changed. We, we are an essential business. So all of our sales personnel and all of our distribution or warehouse transportation personnel they have been physically in the office the entire time uh, because we need them there. So it's really just been our office personnel who, who've been working from home if they can. Um, and so our hiring process has adapted slightly. Uh, we have our online uh, application and phone interview screening that's done by my team. And then we do actually the first interview over the phone. Uh, and so the hiring teams locally would be able to do that. So it's really important to fast and all to be very decentralized in our hiring process and let the local team make those decisions. And so we, we want that phone interview to be done there. And then similarly, we want that second interview to be in person physically in that environment where the job is going to be located so they can see where they would be working and make sure that it's a match for them um, as well. Yeah, ours has shifted quite a bit at Thomson Reuters, um, just because we were used to doing everything in person, whether it was career fairs or on-campus interviews, right? 
Um, and now we're fully virtual at career fairs and, and recruiting students this spring, right? So um, it, it's been quite a shift for us, uh, but I also think it's given us some flexibility um, that Mel talked about earlier too, in terms of uh, we have a really small campus recruiting team. So really it's myself and then uh, one, of, uh, one of our coordinators that helps me out. And between the two of us, it's, it can be difficult to, to necessarily find business leaders that are uh, always have time to, you know, to travel to the school um, and, and spend the full day at the career fair. And instead they've been able to break up their day and spend, you know, two hours and then have somebody else on their team spend two hours. And then we'll spend the last two hours in a, at a six hour event. Right. So um, we've had some flexibility there, but then we've also looked for that in terms of candidates and in terms of our, our interview questions and what we've done. Um, we've used higher view, for example, more often, which is a, a video recording platform. Um, and that's become a, a little bit more normal and a little bit more comfortable for students as they get used to being virtually interviewed and, and doing the virtual recording for uh, for interviews. But we've asked more questions about, you know, being flexible and adaptable with technology um, because we don't know when we're necessarily going to go back in the office. So if, if we're not, it's important that we'll, you know, we'll be able to have students that can still be successful in the summer. So um, yeah, it's shifted a lot. And I think we've taken a lot of learning lessons out of it with, with talking to students too. So um, all good things to take forward to what the post COVID world might be and where we might be virtual for some fairs and then in person for some fairs. So I think that'll be a fun learning experience as we shift back out of COVID. Full transparency for me, I actually worked from home before the pandemic, so that shift wasn't as difficult for me personally, which was nice, but I also got gratification that then my other teammates were like, oh, Danielle's not just eating Cheetos all day on her couch, and you know, <laughs> she's actually working, so um, that was fun, and also fun for me to be able to share some of my tips and tricks when it comes from working from home for my colleagues, and like my husband as well, all of a sudden he, he works at a bank and then he's like at home with me and he, I'll never forget it. He came up on the first day he was home and he came into my office. No joke. It was 9am. And he's like, how do you do this every day? And I'm like, well, you're going to get used to it, buddy. Right. Um, so I think for me, we, as an organization did a lot more, um, items that can be transactional, like the I-9 process, let's do that online, let's make sure we can limit contact as much as we can for candidates and things as well. And then I think for me personally, I did a lot more coaching for the managers and candidates on how to show your personality during a video call and video interview and really being able to share some of those items that we get when we meet in person. And instead of just, you know, staring at the camera, like, okay, can you see me? Am I answering the question correct? Just, okay, let's relax. Let's chat. You know, let's make sure we have this fluid conversation. So I think those were some of the things that I really experienced this past year. And we really made an effort to make our recruiting literature uh, very electronic and easy to share by link, not just by a PDF attachment file, but who knows who can actually open. So we've been really, really great at adapting that literature that we would normally give out or hand out in person and doing that electronically since um, we're an essential business and our employees really have been in the office. All of our sales employees and all of our distribution employees have been working in the office. So it's been really important for us to to be able to do that recruiting, but then our hiring process is important to see actually the environment that they're going to be working in. So we've been, uh, although we've changed our first in-person interview to be over the phone, it's important for us to bring in the, the candidates for sales and distribution and transportation positions into our facilities for that second interview and to see the environment that they'd be working in to make sure that it's a match for all of us. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today and it's been fun walking down memory lane and talking about all the great lessons and tips and tricks that we've picked up along the way. Um, so thanks everyone for your time and students, thanks for tuning in. Um, but this will conclude our first episode of Tune In Tuesday. So thanks everyone and have a good rest of the day.